Hard to know where to start. You have become, and not only were you a great footballer, but you've become just so much bigger since you've finished. You are the preeminent MC of functions going on in this country and almost around the world, Sam. It's a how? very flattering introduction. How, Sam? How, how, no, how come? How come? Well, the manifest modesty will preclude me elaborating in detail, but I suspect, as you would attest to, erudition and good looks are a prerequisite, as you've done very, very well. <laughs> Yes. Well, you, but look, uh, all no, I had no. to do is slip into your slipstream. I mean, to so say you were the pioneer. You know a lot of words that people have never heard of. You use them uh, consistently and you are an exceptional performer. How did you get into this? I always, as a kid, watched Perry Mason. Oh, yeah. And I loved the way he used to address the jury. Yep. And I said... He's eloquent. He's eloquent. Well, I love the eloquent diction. You know, the Queen's language, I loved it, or the King's language. And I was absolutely, you know, grabbed by that. And taken by it. And taken by it, which yep. is probably the apt term. But, uh, and I thought at one stage I wanted to become, you know, involved in the legal profession. A barrister? Until I understood the chicanery that was involved <laughs> with it. So, as you can see, yeah. in the contemporary, yeah. <laughs> where we're heading. So, but I was also a, a man of letters when I, I always did crosswords. Yeah. I love crosswords, and I could never get them out, obviously, but I got some out. <laughs> but the following day, and this is where it's got interesting, the ones I couldn't get out, I'd, I'd, I'd look at the paper the following day and fill them in. But not only did I do that, <laughs> I wrote them all down and I put them in phrase, phraseology yeah. so I could actually, they made, add some meaning to me. So over a long period of time, I developed my own lexicon, your vocab. Yeah, you I understand put. what it means. And uh, not quite like yourself, as eloquent as lengthy, but I became a fairly, fairly uh, well, a wordsmith, a bit of a wordsmith, yes. and I enjoyed it. Not because I wanted to be superior and you know, stand on a pedestal and say, well, God, isn't he eloquent and well-spoken? Yep. But I genuinely enjoyed the Queen's English. I actually played against you for a number of years. In 1968, you started. My first year, if you remember, Vivid, how good's your memory? You ran into me on purpose, and I went down on the wing on the outer side of Arden Street. And you were gentlemanly like, because I don't think even you in those days had any malice or intent in your body. I think you'd like to assert your authority because I was a big new boy on the block. Do you remember that or not? Sam, do you know what? I've known this all my life because I remember doing it and I've never ever brought this up and you've never brought that up never with me up ever, ever before. before. And I can tell you why I did it, because you were starring uh, that day and no one told me to do it and I wasn't the captain, but 1968, and I thought, no, I'm going to just try and um, upset this man somehow and just show that he uh, couldn't run around doing what you were doing to our club at the time. And I did. I ran through you. And I remember saying, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't see you. I well, think I don't know I said, you apologised, but you looked reasonably stunned. Yes. And I must confess, I had no idea how to respond. Because this is... That was my aim. Well, OK. But you've got to understand, it was a big new world for me, you know, playing your first game. Yep you know, coming from a humble background like Merleford and the tobacco fields and all of a sudden thrust into the limelight and play my first game, not even half play, knowing my teammates. I only trained on the Thursday night and I was straight in the side. So I had to acquaint myself with that. And then to, uh, and I remember Billy Goggin, I think Billy might have given me a little snap early doors, yep. which he was prone to, as mm -hmm. you very well know. And then I vividly recall that and I thought, yep. gee whiz, that's it's a bit of a wake-up call. I said, how can people be so nasty? That's extraordinary you bring that up because we've never mentioned that never, ever before ever. and uh, until now. And I the remember defining seeing... Defining moment there, don't I forget that moment. I remember seeing number four. Yeah. And I thought, number four is... Um, he's being a smart-ass. He was uh, toweling us up. Some say uh, you had a wasted talent maybe because you didn't apply yourself. I'm not saying that. That's what some no, say. Would that be consent, unfair? That, no, it's not unfair. But I'll tell you the circumstance leading up to it, if I may be so bold, I'll, I'll praise it as well as I can. I was never you destined to go to time. North Melbourne, because overnight, my brother played at Carlton, who played in the yeah, Premiership side, too. and I was contracted, or contracted, or signed for, or signed something, to go to Carlton, 68. Yep. 
All of a sudden, overnight, the VFL, as was known then, brought in zoning yes. in 68. So the best performed country zone was allocated to the worst performed VFL yes. site, of which the ovens of Murray, where I came from, Myrtleford, was the premier competition. So instead of going to Carlton, which was the reigning premier, I went to the wooden spooner, mm, yep, North Melbourne. Yep. Now, but I've got to tell you, in all honesty, in, on reflection, it was the best thing I did. To go to a club that's almost on its knees and forlorn and beleaguered, to see a true family club and the calibre of people through rain, hail or shine, yep. to stick and be the very fabric of something really great, and then to have the, the good fortune of going through the depths of despair to the pinnacles of success, it is absolutely, it is utopian. Yeah, well, See, some players don't get that opportunity. I was very fortunate that I was at the bottom of the pack and rose and had the opportunity of playing in a premiership, our first ever. So hence, to say, in order to appreciate the highs, you've got to experience the lows, Sam. Well, sometimes they say the true indication or the true uh, assessment of a person is, you know, when they hit rock bottom and how mm. they respond in adversity. Not always when you're perched on top of the, uh, on top of the mountain. Sometimes when you're at base camp or at the, at the bottom, <laughs> it's very difficult. But let me answer your, your, your real question in terms of... Don't bother answering. Was I a waste of talent? Just, just no. keep talking because it's fascinating. I'm trying to return serve with you, but I've, you've got you me... You don't need to. Look, this is not in the... You've knocked me into a cocked hat, mate. You're far too sharp for no, me. No, Sam. <laughs> See, this is the reverse psychology no, of yours. No, it's not. It's good. It's I love it. It's the reverse psychology. But let's stick to the terms of reference. Right. Was I a waste of talent? No, well, I didn't I, say no, that. No, the general perception is yeah. I'll say yes. I had a couple of great years early, two or three great years. Then I had injuries, and then probably the lust of probably somewhere along the line, the way the game was. And I've got to be implicitly honest, I enjoyed the social aspects of, <laughs> yeah, I, I know that. of what football gave me. Yes. I enjoyed the trimmings, and I guess I was, uh, I was, I was a beacon of excess. <laughs> and I guess the opportunity to be the Elvis of the side, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> and I took for granted, Sam, you're listening or not. Oh, mate, I'm not better. wasting my time here. You know, I've got a lot of things to do today. Yep. I, there's no doubt that I took advantage of, of, a, 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 of probably my position. And, and I could have done... And your aura and your reputation. Probably and you're right. And, that, and that's probably <laughs> a weakness on my behalf. Yeah. And it's no good on reflection. Can I correct that? I can't. No. So let's move forward. But having said that, there was a second phase in the late, in, 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 when Barras arrived. Yes. I had some terrific years towards the end when we won the premiership, yes. leading up to that. And then we won the flag, I guess, to me, uh, football wasn't what it... 75? Yeah, 75, yep. our first ever premiership yes, since our I inception know. I'm a, I'm in 1925. Yep. So I guess football didn't have that, all that big a meaning to me after, after we won the flag and we achieved what we did. I still enjoyed the game, but I enjoyed, more importantly, the camaraderie and the mateship of the people. And I guess that's what really what I really liked about yeah. football. And towards the end, I don't know if I enjoyed playing it, but I really enjoyed the, uh, the association of it, if now that makes sense. There's a whole lot of things I want to cover here. So, you, so, so the uh, extravagance of the moment uh, got the better of you so much so that, I know this is well documented, but in the very important aspect of recording your victory in yeah. 1975, the team photo, you couldn't quite make it to the premiership photo because well, one of, these, um, one, one of these things that had distracted your attention over the celebration that night had, was still going on and you, you were with someone and you couldn't come to the team photo camp, Sam. You're breaking up, Sam. Yep, no, am I? No, no you're not. <laughs> no, I missed the photo, you're right. Yes, yes, because you were... One of the true regrets I have, because one of the most prized pieces of memorabilia of the North Melbourne Football Club yeah. has its first ever premiership yeah. photo. And emblazed on our social club wall, if you, you would have been there at some stage I in have. your career, Plenty of time. were the prophetic words of our great hot gospeler, Alan Killigrew, yep. which clearly stated that the 20 players that bring home North Melbourne's first ever flag will gain football immortality. Yep. Now, that didn't really resonate for me when I first arrived there. In fact, I thought it was as distant as winning an Olympic gold medal. But the stark reality was we did achieve it. Yep. 
and for some inexcusable reason I what, missed it. What was that reason? Well, I was engaged in some riveting dialogue, Sam, yeah, with, that's uh, correct. over yeah. the drip tray with a member of the fairer sex, <laughs> which, like yourself, we seem to negotiate fairly successfully. And I think you are even um, presumptuous enough to say <laughs> that Ron Barassi would not summons the team photo unless you were in it, because you were an integral part of it. But alack, alas, Sam, he went on with it without your presence. Well, you know Ron as well as I do. Now, you have known Ron to ever waver. Ron would know to lie. Well, Ron would know the difference between black and white. If he says something, they're the rigid rules. We are just obsequious sycophants of the great man. Whenever he spoke, we just knelt. We hung on every word he said. You know, I used to, I used to shake and I didn't sleep some nights when he spoke. But, <laughs> but you are in the photo, but as someone's body is there and your head has been um, airbrushed or translated. I'm an insert, Sam, yes. An ins are you an insert? Are well, you? they've got an insert on the side there, yes. But, but seriously, Sam, that is a disappointing part of history. Oh, it's though. a shocking part. <laughs> Look. I, just, I, just, I said it's a, I know. it's a one really regret I've got. Yeah. You know, what do you want to do? Stab me down me to the cross? I can't, I no. can't fix no, it. So if I could, if I could, on second, I don't know if I would have forgotten that. Thing, <laughs> I was... <laughs> so, so, so you were larger than life. I remember these days well, Sam. You were larger than life and uh, uh, did extravagant things. Threw your boots into the river one day, didn't you? I During did. training. Why is that? Well, Sam, I think it was Brian Dixon when he was appointed coach. <laughs> well, that very, was enough? No, no, to the contrary. I was a, uh, Brian Dixon, I, I thought, was a great appointment. But the appointment that really sent a shiver down my spine was the appointment of our PT instructor. <laughs> Physical training? Who Physical training. Yep. Ron Clark. Oh, yeah. Who at the time held That's 28 right. world records, That's ranging correct. from 5,000 to That's right. 29 miles. That's correct. So our first, when we arrived at Arden Street, uh, I think there was a memo sent out to bring both your runners and your boots. And I thought, this is unique, we're going to do a bit of both, which is fair enough. Yeah. The first one was we're going to run to Chatston and back. <laughs> now I hadn't driven to Chatston Sam, in my life. In fact, I don't think I knew where Chatston was. <laughs> so I got to the, I'll never forget it. There was that pelting down with rain this night. Remember when the trams were stuck in Flinders Street? Yeah. Well, that's where I was. I had the boots strung across my neck. And you know the, the uh, laces were yeah. cutting into my, into my skin. <laughs> and Teddy, Teddy Whitten, you know, a great brain yeah. of ours, as yeah. you know, was head of Adidas. He got had a pair of Adidas boots, I think, every second week. <laughs> so I had a new pair of boots. I said, I just can't stand this anymore. And I've, you know, we got to Flinders Street from Arden Street. So I was getting a bit tired as well. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't need these, but I can always get a pair of boots, surely. So I hurled them in the river. Unbe unbeknownst to me, the tram full of people started cheering, and right behind me was, of course, Dicko and Ron Clark. <laughs> Ron Clark used to pick me up at six o'clock of the morning and take me for a run from where we lived in Doncaster. How'd that go? Well, I'll tell you what, I did wish to run 5K. This is a true story. Ron Clark ran it backwards. <laughs> He ran, he was jogging backwards. The last two or three cars <laughs> ran backwards. He was jogging backwards. It was an insult. Oh. And I was pounding away at a million miles an hour. Probably with you when you, maybe the day that you were meant to be at training at Arden Street, but someone saw you on the television at the races. <laughs> um, God, you're well researched, Sam. No, we're we're the, the, these Where are, do you find the time? You've got the cars, you've got everything. Sam, this is from recollection. Yeah, recollection. I, you, you forget we It was. I went similar. to the Wagger races. I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> with Brian Mulverhill. Remember Brian Mulverhill? Yep. It was an expensive recruit from South Australia. This yep. is a true story on my brother's life. We go to Wagga. Wagga's Wednesday and Thursday. We <laughs> train Tuesday. We had a bad day Saturday. Dicko said, anyone who doesn't turn up Thursday for training will be sacked. So we go to Wagga. I'm thinking the Wagga Cup's on a Wednesday. Wagga Cup was a big meeting. And a number of other mates of ours would go. So anyhow, we got to Wagga, and here, right, the Wagga Cup was on the Thursday. So I'll never forget, we stayed at the motel in Wagga. So training would have been a fairly important... Training, Thursday no, was a vibe, my word, Thursday but, was important. Yeah. So <laughs> the Cup's on the Thursday at three o'clock, and we drove, I said to Brian, I said, Brian, I said, look, you're going a bit ordinary, mate. I said, you better get back to... Uh, 
Melbourne, you take the car back to Melbourne and uh, you get back, he said, because he'll definitely drop you. He said, won't drop me, no, no way in the world would I get dropped. So anyhow, lo and behold, I wake up on the Friday morning at the motel. You know how they slide the paper under yeah, the door? Yeah, do. yep. I get the paper and I'm just welshing down to the... Uh... Breakfast. No, I wasn't. I was sitting on the corona. Uh, <laughs> just sort of just looking, just grabbing the paper. There I was on the front page. Care could be jaxed. I, I remember waking up one day and uh, seeing you on the front page of the truth, naked. Yes. Just uh, just at a whim, the, or they said, Sam, would what, you get your... This was pretty risque in those days. Well, it was risque, but, well, you know, it was... How did that come about? <laughs> how did that come about? Just a bit of advertising, free advertising for later... Well, I wrote the, for the truth in those days yeah. with Brian Hansen and them, and... Yeah. And they I said, th Sam... Well, I think there was a couple of competitions went around at the time, too, which I remember winning a cruise for two around Fiji, which I said, my mother, would you believe? And they had... So you won it? I won it. But that wasn't the reason why, why I had that nude centrefold. What was the reason, sir? I got no idea what the nude centrefold was. <laughs> I just, I accepted it. I think it was might have been a, a small stipend, as you know. Yeah. We didn't get paid a great deal of money no. in those days. And to all men, a, a mere income <laughs> was, you know, fairly appealing, <laughs> even though I had to sort of humble myself to a degree. That's right. So. You weren't complete, did you? Well, was, well you know, you, you was there a, did you wearing a, a thong or a strap or something? Or? No, I had the, had the Sharon. In front of the uh, bits and pieces? I did, yes. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. I've got to say, with whatever your sexual preferences, you know, I wasn't anatomically embarrassed. No, I've heard that. I, no, I, no, I mean, uh, uh, in, I in total structure. I know exactly what you mean. You so. know, I had a football in front of me, so... It was Big fairly football. tastefully done. It wasn't... No, uh, no, very tasteful. It was. <laughs> no, extraordinarily. <laughs> and, oh, um, you were pulling my leg here. No, certainly no, not. Certainly and not. so then you were offered, I think, uh, from memory, uh, you were offered a, uh, to go over and try out uh, for American football as a gridiron it player. Was. It was a kicker. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, did, how did that come about? Well, <coughs> they had... Did it eventuate? Well, on the did verge of... They had recruits out here and they had a trial kicking him. And as you know, in that game, it's all about hang time. Yes. And I was fairly good at it, the trial that I had. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Chuck Knox who was the, the uh, coach of the uh, New York Jets, where Joe Namath was a quarterback at the time. Yep. Anyhow, we all got down to serious discussions, serious trials. So much so that I think I was, I was going to go to the States, have a trial. And I had a very bad car accident in Turak Road one yep. night. How did you get into the lamb? Someone came and said to you... Well, I did a show on the ABC called The Fat. Yes. And The Fat, I used to do political monologues and just yes. you know, script a couple of monologues. I saw them. They were written for me, but then I became pretty proficient at writing myself. I enjoyed writing. Yep. Because I enjoyed their wit and they... In those days, the ABC were all about... Yep. ...teaching talent, promoting local talent mm -hmm. and not being uh, political animals. Yep. And they were very, very good at it. So the fat was a wonderful vehicle and a launching pad and very helpful for me personally. So Dave Thomason, who was the MLA, the late Dave Thomason, who was a marketing manager, saw this down the barrel presentation of mine. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he saw... Some potential. Some potential in terms of advertising in a different marketing. line. Yep. Yeah, so slightly, slightly more audacious. Mm -hmm. He was spirited and daring. He said, instead of going that through those bland commercials... Yeah. Bit off the cuff, bit ad-lib. Bit ad-lib, it was ad-lib, yeah. off the cuff and down the barrel. And you know it makes sense, I'm Sam Kekovich. Someone decided to uh, take the thing overseas and see if we could get Australian lamb into the United States, I presume, and you went over there. The underlying thing was obviously to promote lamb. But the other message was to eradicate all things un-Australian, un-Australian behaviour. So after five years, we came to the conclusion that I'd done as much as I could to eradicate all things un-Australian. So we need to embark on a global campaign to see if we can do it globally. Yep. yep. But we're more important, we need a global figure yep. to sort of give me the profile and the status to take on the world. And that figure was? And that figure at the time was Donald so, Trump. So how did he become that? Who picked him out to well, be the global figure? Well, at the time he was doing a show called The Apprentice. Yeah, he was. And The Apprentice was fairly big. 
and Very Donald good. Trump was large as life. And since he's become the president, um, I wouldn't be speaking out of school, Sam, but I think you're one of the few people in the world that has his own personal uh, cell phone number and can speak to him uh, when have. you wish. I, well, I don't know whether this is still the same number, but I tell you, when I left, I had the best half hour in his office yep. that he seconded me to, which no one's ever been to. He said, you're only the second person Australian that I've ever invited into this office. Now, there I was in his office, the size of Alaska, his office overlooking the whole. Yep. <laughs> so, it was unbelievable. Fifth Ave, you know, where Trump yep. Tower is. So he signed me his latest book and he gave me his card and his private cell phones. He said, do you ever want anything? You make sure you ring me. Well, I wanted to go to a steakhouse in Brooklyn and I couldn't get in. Cut a long story short, he said, I can't get in. He said, how many of you are there? He said, I said, four. He said, he said, you'd be there at seven o'clock. He said, just mention my name. Well, when you get there, I'm telling you, it's the whole world. It's every, 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 every mobster's yep. limo would pull up. Yep. They'd get out, and it was a truly old world steakhouse. Yep. And they looked at me with total disdain and dismissiveness when I walked up there, and they said, oh, yes, Trump. Oh. <laughs> in here, sir. Now, have you got any regrets? In, is there anything I know... You can't do anything about anything. No, I can't, you can't. I got regrets on the premiership photo. I got regrets perhaps I didn't try harder and fulfilled the expectation of a lot of people who are very yeah. dear to me to be a lot better player. I would love to have been a better person. Sometimes I transgressed in my formative years only because I wanted to be a lot better. I wanted to be something to everyone. Coming from Merleford, a kid, a raw kid, you know, you don't know who you're mixing with, but the one thing I really wanted to, which probably precluded me being a leader among us, is because I want to be something to everyone. You know, everyone like to be, I'd like to be acknowledged, you know, God, he's a good bloke, he's a good bloke. But after a while, it wears thin, because you know you do get handled, and I handle all that very, very poorly. Do you think so you're do good... I have any regrets? That aspect I don't, because I think it's made me more worldly and more rounded, and I probably am the person I am today. Do you think you're a good bloke? I am a good bloke. Well, I try to be a good bloke. Now, I want to finish on this, Sam. You um, did a commercial in Rome for lamb. I did. And you did it in a... Lamborghini. Lamborghini. Was a part of the ad, yes. Right to your side here, there is a Lamborghini. There is. Not only uh, am I impressed by that, but I want to see, I don't believe you got into the Lamborghini. I want to see if you can fit in that Lamborghini. So if I opened the door, would you see if you could squeeze yourself in behind the wheel, just pretending it was a lamb commercial we were doing? I'd love to, Sam. If well, that's going to, look, if that's going to bring a smile to your dial, <laughs> to that visage of yours, I am going to endeavour to. Uh, and in the event that I fail, our relationship won't change one little bit. Uh, and I'm hoping you find... I'm sure you think that I won't fit in it. But no, no, I'm... I'm I, I put, you I, have reservations. I've got reservations, yeah. but my word, I'd love you well, to prove me wrong. Well, let me tell you something before you take me up with that challenge. If I can't fit, I'll break the steering wheel to fit into it. No, <laughs> <laughs> Holy mackerel. So there you go. That's the seat and that's the steering wheel. In you go. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well done. You understand when I shot it in Rome yeah. some 10 years ago. <laughs> I had a bit. But uh, now you could do it like that. You could hold a chop out the side yeah. of the air. But you know, in simple layman's terms, we always say the higher the monkey climbed the tree, the more the monkeys asked you see. <laughs> and as I always say to all of you out there, I know there's a lot of a, grief, a lot of grievances out there that perpetually aggrieve. But do me a favour, take a tip from me. It is better to light the candle than curse the darkness. And next time you take a drink of water, remember those that dug the well. You know it makes sense. Yeah. And as Confucius said, <laughs> man in the car with tool in hand, not necessarily mechanic.